All right, I want to welcome those that uh, that are visiting with us via Facebook and uh, and through YouTube and so forth. Well, we're so glad that you could be with us, and I trust that the Word of God will be a blessing to you, and we're glad to have you in our services here tonight, as well as our people, and, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6. We want to continue on with our study of the Old Testament basics, and uh, we're just, remember, we're just sort of skimming a rock and going across these these books, and uh, but there are just so many things that happen in the book of Genesis. Remember, there are four outstanding events, and there are four outstanding characters, and uh, and what we're about to look at uh, is going to be the third of the four great events. The first one, of course, was creation. Then there was the fall, and now we want to look at the flood, the flood that the that the, uh, that the Bible describes. And so look here with me in Genesis chapter six and, uh, and let's, let's look at these first few verses that are here, all right? The Bible says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. We're going to have more to say about that verse. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw the wickedness of man, was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and, uh, and, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them man. What a tragedy, what a tragedy. All right, let's pray one more time. Father, uh, would you add a blessing to the reading of your word, Lord, as we study it tonight? May our hearts be open before you, Father, and may, truly may the Holy Spirit be our teacher and guide tonight, Lord, as we, uh, Lord, try to communicate your truth to your people in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll give you the praise and honor for what takes place, Lord, the good that'll be done, the edifying, we give you the glory for it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, again, this is the third of the four great events of the book of Genesis. And uh, just so let me just ask you a question. Do you really believe that there was a worldwide flood? Do you really believe that? Uh, you'd be surprised. How many, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're living in an age where people still think that the earth is flat. You know, uh, you, you've heard that, right? That there are people out there that are like that, flat earthers, they're called. And uh, they believe that. They're the same kind of folks, I suspect, that believe that, that when they landed on the moon, that was all done in some sort of sound studio in Hollywood and that nobody really landed there or not, all right? And, uh, oh, man, we, they're just, it just takes all kinds of people to make up the world, all right? It really does. But, uh, but there really was a worldwide flood, you know, and, and, with, and I, you say, well, do you believe there was? I do, without a doubt. I believe there was. I mean, Jesus believed that there was a worldwide flood. Listen to what he said. He said in the book of Matthew in chapter 24, he said this, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. That's Matthew 24 and 37. The Lord believed and there was a worldwide flood. He was describing the times that Noah lived in, what, what took place there. And listen to 2 Peter. It says, for this, they willingly are ignorant. That means they were dumb on purpose. That's what that means, all right? They were willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth, now watch, standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's 2 Peter 3, verses 5 and 6. So the world can't perish if this was just a local flood. And I will just throw this out here for you also. The Bible is going to say that the, that the, that the uh, waters rose above the mountains some 15 cubits above the tops of the peaks of the mountains. If it was a local flood, how in the world could it have done that? And so we know that it was a worldwide flood that took place. And, uh, and so uh, let's look at three things here tonight. Let's look at some things. 
And uh, I, I believe this will be a blessing to you, but I want you to see, first of all, that God was grieved. God had been grieved. And, uh, and, and you know, and the sad part about it was, listen, if there was, ever, if there was ever a society that we know little about, it's the group of people that lived between the time of the fall and the time of the flood. Now, we know, we know about Cain's line and Enid and Lamech and so forth, the artificer of brass and one with music and the one who was a murderer, and he bragged about that. I mean, we know about that. We know about the lines of Seth and so forth and, and what transpired there, the death of Abel at the hands of Cain. We know about that little segment of it, but I want you to know between the, between the fall and the flood, some 16 years is going to pass in just two chapters. Some 1,600 years. Methuselah is still alive at this time. Enoch's already gone, right? He was translated. The Lord took him. But Methuselah is still alive. How long did Methuselah live? 969 years. The man, And you know what his name means, right? Methuselah means when he dies, it shall come. So the Lord already saw what was going on, could already see what was going to take place. He, fore, he foresaw this in his foreknowledge, of course. And, uh, and so the reason why there's not much written about it, because why would you want to write about a period of time when men are so depraved? You know, God is not, God is not going to, if you will, he's not going to brag on the accomplishments of a wicked and depraved people. He's not going to do that. But here's the thing. After Adam's fall, the mankind's downward spiral, it intensified with the passing of time and the increase of population. Notice what it says in verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. And so, so what God had set into motion between Adam and Eve was taking place. And there, was, there were these marriages and so forth and they began to proceed. Now listen. It's no small thing to grieve the Lord to the place where it repented him that he had made man. You think about it when you consider how long suffering is our heavenly father and how long suffering is God and how they must have provoked him and tempted him and prodded him and, and if you will, grieved him to the place where, where, he, where he regretted that he had made man. That's what that means to repent of. He was regretting that he had made man. And, uh, and, and, you know, and why was that? Because, well, first of all, I want you to see in this grieving of the Lord, there were vile relationships between a godly line and an ungodly line of mankind. There were those, there was the line of Seth, if you will, that was the godly line, and there was the ungodly line, I believe, the line of Cain. And uh, there was an intermingling of these. And so, so you know, there were these relationships. Notice what it says. It says, that, that, notice what it says, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. Now, some people want to say, and I'm just going to throw this out here for you. I don't have time to go over it. But I don't believe that this is angels. Angels are not given in marriage. So I'm not, according to what Jesus said in the New Testament. So I don't believe that angels... Uh, if you will, had had relationships with human beings, and then therefore there was some sort of half man, half demon, half. I, gosh, that's the kind of stuff that Hollywood uh, dreams up. I, I just think that these there was a godly line of men, and there was an ungodly line, uh, if you will, of the daughters of men that they were fair, and uh, and uh, you know they were nice looking, and so they took them wives of all which they chose. And, uh, and so the giants that came in the land, I think those were just sort of the natural things, like what happened. Remember the sons of Anak? What, what, no, I'll just throw this out here. Why do you suppose that David, when he went down to that brook, got out five smooth stones? Why did he do that? It wasn't, it wasn't just one. It wasn't five for Goliath. He took one, he took with one stone, took Goliath down, but Goliath had some brothers, and they were giants. They were large men and so forth. And so he got enough for the bag for all the family. Amen, I believe, is what he did. And so, uh, and so here, uh, these giants in the land, and when I think about it, look at the last part of verse 4. It says, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. What were they known for? They were known for their wickedness. That's what they were known for. They were known for their wickedness. And haven't there been men down through in modern times here, what I would say to be modern times, since, 
since newspapers and the like, haven't there been wicked men that have lived over the years? Uh, we think about America, and boy, we think America's been here for so long, and really are, what, 1776 to where we are? That's 24, and you add 200 to that, three, about 300, and some, 300 years or whatever. Uh, there are about 250 plus years that we've been around. Europe has, a, has five times that much history. What do you think about it? And uh, even some other, and even some other other uh, other places have had history. Look at look at the, like the dynasties of the of the Chinese and the Japanese and how long they have been around. And uh, and I'm sure within their histories they have known wicked men that lived in those times, just as we have. And we've had our we've had our Al Capones. We've certainly had our Adolf Hitlers. We've had our Goebbels and so forth. We've had all these guys and their wickedness and what they did. But these vile relations, because think about it now, what does, what in common, what, you know, what fellowship do good and evil have together? They really have none. What communion does light have with darkness? It has none. And, uh, you know, Christ and the devil have no fellowship. Good and evil have nothing in common. And I'm just going to say these vile relationships, and this is why in the New Testament, it clearly states for us, listen to this passage, that believers and unbelievers should never be joined together, particularly not to be unequally yoked together. That's speaking about a marriage relationship. Why? Because we, we're to be raising a godly seed, a godly heritage. That's what we're to be leaving behind, not one of a mixed multitude, if you will. Notice what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39, it says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. And there's a little caveat on there, only in the Lord. That, that uh, if we had younger people in here right now, if we had some singles in here, younger singles and so forth, and they were sort of, you know, looking around, they ought to be looking for somebody that's who, who is a person of faith. That they ought to be looking for somebody who's a Christian. Who, uh, that they would feel led to pray with and read the Bible with and so forth. There, there are some constraints upon uh, our, our choosing of our mates in, in, for down the road. And, uh, and we're not to be unequally yoked together. 2 Corinthians 6 and 14 says, Be ye not un, un, unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? There were these vile relationships. And when you put a believer and an unbeliever and you put them together in marriage, you know what happens? Usually it's the, it's the believer that winds up making a choice and yielding to the unbeliever. And usually if that, in one of those situations, a lot of times the, the, uh, the unbeliever will wind up leaving the relationship and then leave that person stranded. And, uh, and the Bible says, and we, uh, there'll be some other things probably I'll talk about marriage down the road, but, but certainly you're not under bondage in those situations when you've been abandoned by an unbeliever. And so, uh, and so vile relationships between the godly line and the ungodly line were never intended to be. And so, beloved, we've got to set our sights a little higher. And we've got to train our children and our grandchildren. We've got, we've got to do that. We need to, we need to emphasize those things in their lives as we have opportunity. And I, you know, I know that we're probably everybody in here is a grandparent. I understand that. And many of you that are watching, you know, your grandparents and you say, well, there's a limitation. There is a limitation, but nonetheless, you and I, we still need to stand for it right. Amen. Amen. We still need to. And, uh, and I don't try to cross the line with my children or with my grandchildren. They have to make decisions. But here's what the Bible says. You know, it says, it says children obey in Ephesians chapter 6. It says, it says, children obey your parents, right? As this is fit in the Lord. And then it says, honor thy father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. So what is the difference between children obey your parents and then honoring your father and mother? Here's the deal. When they're at home, they ought to obey you. When they get grown and they move out, they ought to honor you by doing right. And not be parasites, but be productive citizens. Amen. Hey, thank you, sister. Amen, brother Ed. I was going to say it. It's true. That's how you honor your mom and dad. That's how you're honoring your parents. You're contributing to society for its good and bringing light in the community. Makes a difference. It's how you honor your mother and father. And so, and so what happened here 
is that there were these vile, vile relationships that had taken place. And then notice, I want you to see that vice had filled the imaginations of the offspring of these marriages. Notice what it says. Look, look at verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And now watch. And that every imagination. That word imagination, you ought to underline that if you're not opposed to marking in your Bible. I mark in mine. If you're not opposed to doing it. Uh, you know, your Bible is a very personal book. And, uh, and, and places where God speaks to your heart. I don't think it's wrong to put a notation in there. Or something along those lines. But that word imagination you ought to underline because it has to it has to do with the meaning of fashioning, devising, or shaping, or creating, and their motive was wicked in their intent. You know, technology is a wonderful thing, except when it's used for evil purposes. I think the telephone is a wonderful thing, but when it's used for the evil purposes, it's not a good thing. You know, technology, uh, and you know, we can lose technology over time. I mean, I don't, I don't know what kind of artisans and craftsmen there were that built the, 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 that built the pyramids, but boy, man has come a long way from that kind of architecture. And so you follow what I'm saying? The computer has replaced a lot of what men have lost over the years because of their carnality, because of their depravity. We're only using a party to say, well, how far did Adam fall? He fell a long way. When you consider that he was there fellowshipping with God, was naming the animals, was talking and so forth, to where he actually believed that he, if he hid behind a tree, God couldn't find him. That's really not very bright. You follow what I'm saying? So, he, you know, he took a little plunge there in his, in his brain power. And, and, uh, and we have done the same thing. And so, so fashioning, they were devising. And listen, and the, and the depths of their depravity has never been mine. Do you understand what I mean when I make that phrase? They've never been able to measure the depths of depravity that are out there. I, I, read, about, I read about something in the paper, about, about uh, something that has come forth, and I, I hate to say it, but, they, but they, uh, they have arrested a pastor in Tennessee. I, I, I believe it was a charismatic word, but it doesn't matter. Somebody that was naming the name of God and trying to present him, if you will, to the to the world and so forth, but he was found in some sort of illicit thing involving a secretary and then the young people in the school that they had. So this pastor, you know, who's married to somebody else and the secretary or somebody involved in the school was involving young people in this and it's come for... I mean, it's horrible. But the Bible says that God saw the wickedness of man was what it was great in the earth. I, you know, I, I, I don't know how he's measuring the wickedness in the earth today by comparison. I don't know. But it seems like it seems like each week, each week we learn about something more horrid, something more vile, something more beyond our. I mean, you know, you, you just can't make this stuff up. But people are doing it. And, uh, and, so, and so they were mighty men of wickedness. Look, look, and it, no, notice what it says. There are those giants in the earth and they were wicked in their imaginations. Now watch. And the thoughts of his heart was only evil sporadically? No, it says continually. Continually. So were the, there were these vile relationships that had, a, that had vice as the offspring, if you will, of their depravity and violence... Was filling the earth. Did you did you hear what happened yesterday? They were doing. They were celebrating something last evening uh, in California, and it's not just in California that these things happen. But they were celebrating something. It was within the Chinese culture or the Asian culture. You know, they go through the year of the rat and the dog or whatever. This is the this is some sort of lunar new year for them. Or yesterday was, and so they had a large gathering of people. It was quiet. It was, there was no trouble. And all of a sudden, the guy comes in there, and he just starts shooting. He kills 10 people, and he wounds several others. And the last I saw, that he's, they, they've got him uh, hemmed up in a, in a van. And the police have got it surrounded. they got SWAT teams around there. And I don't know why they just don't go in there and knock the doors out of that thing and, and quit playing around. But I'm not, you know, I'm not a cop. And, uh, you know, and they've got to be sensitive to everybody. But if this is the person, man, they killed 10 people. Anyway, 
That's where we are. Now listen, I'm not trying to preach about the headlines. I'm just covering what's here, but it seems like God gives us a headline to confirm what's in His Word. We're living in a violent world. It's a violent society. You know, uh, you know when, when, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, did people carry guns as a rule? No. Now, hey, when I was in school, we had them in the back glass of our vehicles and our trucks, and we never bothered anybody with them. Amen, we didn't. I grew up in Missouri. People had those things. And... Uh, you know, but I don't remember my dad ever carrying a gun and having, having to walk around and do that, that kind of stuff and have to worry about church services and people being, uh, people being armed in the church. Oh, man, we would have said, well, what's wrong with you, man? There's nobody out there going to be bothering us. Well, that's not the way that it is in America today. And it's not that the guns have promoted this. It's the depravity of man that has increased. You know, it's funny when somebody shoots someone and, man, it makes the papers or whatever and how outrageous it is and, and how, uh, how offended people are and how they say, man, we just don't need these things. You, we need to get them off the street. Well, look at the people that are killed in vehicles because of liquor. Yes. They don't want to ban cars. And they certainly don't want to ban alcohol. Why? That, that's money, man. That's revenue. We don't want, we can't do without that. I remember in Louisiana when we were there, man, they, you know, what, there used to be a bar room. I don't even know if it's still open or not. It might be, but there was a bar room not far from the church there at the Faith Baptist Church in Franklin, Louisiana. And, uh, and man, we could hear the music from that. It was called Cousins. That's a French word for cousins. Cousins. That's a Cajun French word for it. Cousins. And it was two cousins that got together, put a bar room together and had that crazy music and everything. And it would vibrate the walls in, in the church or in our home, that, that heavy bass, boom, you know how that penetrates those low frequency waves. But, you know, it, it wasn't unusual for someone to come out of there drunk or whatever and take the wrong turn and come down the driveway into the church. One time he even went up and knocked on the pastor's door. He'd been all beat up and cut up and everything. People were chasing him and all. So what did we do? Eventually, it became such a it became such common fare that we went to this like the city council. They're called a police jury down there, and we pleaded with them to have a bar closing ordinance to shut the bars down after a certain time on Saturday nights, and they wouldn't do it. The other towns in the community and surrounding area they were closing theirs down. So guess where all the drunks were going? They were all coming to Franklin because they could still drink. Every mom and pop little store in there sold whiskey and hard liquor. When you talk about the accidents and all the people that are killed every year as a result, they don't want to ban cars and they don't want to get rid of the liquor. But let somebody get, let somebody get shot and they want to do away with a gun. Yeah. Their logic just doesn't hold any water, does it? It's another indication of how depraved they are. They love the dollars more than they love the decency. I can't imagine what the world was like then. How bad it must have been. But the earth was filled with violence. No wonder God was grieved. But you know, just like our Lord, I want you to know God had grace. God had grace. You say, how do I know that? Look up there in verse 3. Notice what it says. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. You know what the Lord was giving them? He was giving them one hundred and twenty years. He was giving them a space. Do you remember what happened when Jonah finally got right? Jonah, the mixed up missionary. You know, when he finally got that right, he went to Whale College. Right, amen. Graduated and went into Nineveh and began to preach. And he said, what, 40 days? There was going to be judgment. Man, and what did they do? Those folks believed him, didn't they? And man, from the king, from the king to the beggar. 120,000 people, they say. I, I suspect probably the biggest revival in record in the Bible. All right, 120,000. It makes, it makes the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost seem pretty small, doesn't it? 120,000 people got right because they believed. God told them. And here we see that there's 120 years. God is giving them 120 years to get right. 
they knew some things back then. Because listen, when Noah got off the boat, everybody had the about everybody that was on the ark had the knowledge of God. Amen. They did. That's part of the reason why God can hold man responsible because they had the knowledge of God. And when they knew God, they what? They rejected him and put him away. And here he gives them 120 years. He just didn't summarily say, all right, today's it. That's it. And wipe him out. He could have done that. But he said, my spirit's not going to put up with this forever. And he said, I understand your flesh. I understand that. But he said, well, I made you. I know. And I'm going to give you 120 years. And how long was, according to the New Testament, how long was, was Noah a preacher of righteousness? 120 years. So while he was building, he was barking. Amen. While, while construction was going on, man, he was preaching, the Bible says, teaching us that. So God had grace. Regard, I mean, 120 years to repent and to get right. But they were calloused and they were careless. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, as it was in the days, they were what, marrying and giving in marriage. They really could have cared less about the coming judgment. God gave him 120 years. But look what it says. Look, look in chapter, look, look, look in verse 8. Notice what it says. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now why was that? The writer of Hebrews tells us. He explains it to us, brother. He said, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not as seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which... He condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. God had grace. Noah believed God and moved with fear and did what he was told. And, and the scripture says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. And so what happened? Noah fashioned the ark after God's design. Look at verse, look at verse 13. I'm in chapter 6, verse 13. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the ark, with the earth. Verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Pardon me. Room shalt thou make in the ark, shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And so this is this is a wonderful thing, all right? Now Noah fashioned the ark after God's design. Now notice what he said. Look at verse 15. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits. So it is six times longer than it is wide. That is a six to one ratio. Do you know that that is still the ratio used today for ocean going vessels for safety as well as for comfort in weathering the storms and waves that are out on the sea? Prior to the late 19th century, that is the 1800s, Brother Larry, all right, that, that time, there, wasn't, there was another ship that the, the Italians built one of similar length. Why? At that time. And it was a six to one ratio. There was nothing in between the time of the ark and, mo if you will, in modern times until that time. That's when it came about. Somebody else built something similar to that with that ratio. And they, it's the same ratio that's used today in these ships and it's a six to one and the, and the beauty of this is i mean uh, when you think about it it's the best design to weather the worst storms and there was a storm of judgment that was coming upon the land coming upon the whole earth and it's the perfect type of christ notice what it says look at verse 14 thou shalt make the ark out of gopher wood room shalt thou make now watch and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Do you know what that word pitch? It's a tar substance. It is the same word as the word atonement. I love that. The atonement. The covering. The Yom Kippur. The covering that we have. The blood. It's a picture of the type of the blood of Christ. It kept the water out. It, it kept them safe on the inside. And it kept the judgment of God from coming in, uh, you know, into the ship and so forth. And so it had pitch within and pitch without. And it was the atonement that was there, all right? And so notice what it's, I want you to look at chapter 7. Let's look at verse 16. In this grace, it was the Lord that shut them in. 
Notice what it says. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God has commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. You know, what you have to see in here is that God is in charge of the door. <laughs> Amen. Not Noah. Noah was in charge of the window that was in the top so that he could look up. He could look heavenward. He didn't need to see the judgment and everything that was going on down here. And you know, that's going to be one of the beauties about us. When we go to heaven, when the rapture takes place and we go out of here, we're going to be enjoying the marriage supper. Amen. We're going to be on the honeymoon. And that was going to be what, remember what, what uh, the Lord, what, what Laban told Jacob? fulfill her week all right uh, of the honeymoon and so forth we're going to be in that seven years and what are they going to be having here on earth they're going to be having trouble by the by the square foot i mean it's going to be the time of jacob's trouble like a time that's never been seen before that's where i was reading as a lost man water turned to blood stuff coming out of the sky things coming out of the ground hair like a, a woman and like a lion and tail with a sting and i don't want to be down here for all that the judgment of God called Jacob's trouble in the Bible. There wasn't a window in the side of the ship to see all that death and all that judgment. There was just a window in the top to be able to look up. To look up. And beloved, that's what we had. That's why I said it's a perfect type of Christ. Everyone in the ark lived. Everyone outside the ark died. And so they were sealed. And isn't that what the Spirit of God has done for us? We are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise is what Paul said. Man, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid, when they would put up preserves, probably that what they did at your house too. We had strawberries and we had other berries that would be putting up. And, and uh, something I always like to do when you would open them up is I like to get the wax out of the top and chew it. You know, it didn't. I was never a crayon eating boy, all right? But I like to chew on that wax. Didn't you do that? I mean, I even chewed tar when I was little. I don't know why I'm telling you all this stuff. Man, you've done some of the same things. Don't look out there like, I, I never did that. Yes, you did. I know you did. Man, that, that ground would get hot and that tar would come up. I chewed it, man. I chewed it. That's why I've got such pretty teeth today. <laughs> But I would like to get that wax out of there because it always had a little bit of that preserve on the bottom of it. Tasted like the berries or whatever. But that preserve, what was, it, what was the name for it? You would buy it in the store. It was called paraffin. Right? A petroleum byproduct. And what's interesting, I like how words, I love etymologies. That's the study of word roots and where they went. You know the word for where, where the spirit comes along as the comforter? He is the paraclete. To seal me just like what that paraffin did to those preserves. I mean, look at the name, preserves. We didn't call them spoiled. Yeah. I, I put up some strawberry spoilage. No, we didn't do that. We called them strawberry preserves. Didn't you? Yeah. Didn't they call them preserves? You canned them? Why? So what, what, that seal up there protected what was on the inside. And then we got that. We're covered with that pitch. Amen. On the inside and out. I'm telling you, in though, though there was great judgment and God repented, man, I'm telling you, our Heavenly Father is a God of grace. Amen. Oh, yes. He's a God of grace, yes. grace, yes. and a grace that saves and grace that satisfies. You know, and I don't exactly know what life was like there for, for Noah, man. There were animals to tend and things to have to clean up and and uh, I took one of those visits. We went to the Ark Encounter. Any of you all ever been there to the Ark Encounter? It was very interesting, wasn't it? How all that took place. And uh, it was an eye-opener about some of those things. And, uh, but I just know this. I just know this, that, that all they had to do in those days was believe like Noah believed. Believe what he was preaching, what God had said. That judgment was going to come, but they could take refuge. You know, can you imagine what it must have been like? Hey, it's going to rain. What's that, Noah? Remember, there had only been a mist, right? That's all there'd ever been. There was enough of temperature change to create that evaporation and so forth. And there was a mist that watered all the land. He said, it's going to rain. What's that? They didn't have an idea. Man, judgment's coming. God's going to, oh, man. How long, you know, look, look how long we've been here. Man, God's not going to do anything. He's not even, he's not paying attention to us. Yes, he was. 
people just think they just have the wrong opinion about God. He's not an old man with a beard in a rocking chair. He's not. And we know that, but the world doesn't know that. And they think, they think that he's a lot like them and that they just look the other way about bad behavior. I mean, man, parents are afraid to be parents. Teachers are afraid to be teachers. Policemen sometimes are afraid to be policemen and exercise authority. Everybody has to walk on eggshells because we got, you know, we just live in such a litigious society. In other words, they love litigation is what I mean by that. And everybody's worried about that. Everybody's concerned about that. And you're afraid to be a parent. But God is paying attention and God is keeping track. And all they had to do was believe God through Noah's preaching and testimony and they would have been spared. But they didn't. Only eight people. Only eight people. Everyone in the ark lived. Everyone outside the ark perished. Can you imagine what the sounds must have been like? You say, could they hear anything? I believe they could. And you say, well, you know, these animals and all. You know, people have strange ideas about this and, and, and the like about, you know, well, how big were the animals? They could have been very small. They probably were to make room for everything that was on there. And that, that are, that's a big place though, wasn't it? Those three stories on the inside and all that they had in there, things to make repairs and so forth <clears throat> and the like and provisions and food and, and all those things that had to be done. In addition to just building, then you got to pack it. But the Lord brought them on. You say, well, man, that must have been something. How'd they get all those animals there? Well, you know what? That was the time before, that was the, time before the land was divided. That's the reason why there were those, if you will, those land bridges that they talk about sometimes. The evolutionists want to at least say that was true. That's the reason why you find like a mastodon somewhere. They find one maybe down here in America that was also maybe over in Africa. How they did it? Because the lands had not been divided yet. There may have only been one continent. Have, have you ever looked at the map, how they do that when they when they sort of carve it out and they put it all flat out here. If you were to look at it, doesn't Africa look like it goes right up here against South America? Yes, it does. You know, they even know that, you know, that the Atlantic Ocean, I, I, I took a class in geology in college and the Atlantic Ocean in there, they can find the trough, they can find the channel in the ocean floor where that, if you will, where that river came out of there and it was really only about 10 feet. Or... Those land masses all fit together. And even this whole platelet stuff, you know who discovered that, right? Didn't you? That was an elementary school girl. She did a little science project and she made her hypothesis. And she said, I know why the earthquakes take place. She said, just like two plates, they got them here together and they push against each other and they push. And then suddenly one goes up underneath the other one. And somebody sent that in and it got sent someplace else and someplace else. And all these high powered men said, well, yes, of course, that's what it must be. Out of the mouth of babes, amen. And so they call them tectonic, like the Tetons. They call them tectonic plates. That's what they are. I just said all that to say that God is gracious, amen. amen. He's gracious. Everybody in the ark lived. Everybody outside the ark died. It'll be the same way when judgment comes. The next time, except it won't be water. What's it going to be? It's going to be fire. It's going to be fire. But I want to leave you on a good note. All right. God was grieved. God is gracious. But I want you to see that God is also good. Yes. He is good. Look in, look in chapter 8 with me. This flood takes place over chapter 6, 7, and, and 8. Look in chapter 8 with me. Now the waters all totaled, I'm just going to throw this out here to you, the waters all totaled being on the earth were about some 370, uh, if you will, about 370 days. The flood starts with Noah in the second month of the 600th year and it ends, if you will, totally it ends um, around... Notice what it says, and in the look in chapter 8 and look in verse 14. It says, in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. 
Verse, let's go back to 13. And it came, I'm in chapter 8, verse 13. It came to pass in the 601st year. It started in the 600th year in the second month. And now it's the 601st year in the first month, the first day of the month. The waters were dried up from off the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Verse 14. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month was the earth dried. So a total of about 370 days thereabouts. I have more information on that if you're really interested in that. 40 days, 40 nights of rain. It was there for five months and then it took so many months for it to, the wind to come and begin to blow and recede. And then he waited till the 10th month and then he waited 40 more days and so forth. We're not going through all that, but I'm just going to say that God is good. Look in chapter 8 and look at verse 1. Notice what it says. And God remembered. Aren't you glad? Boy, people are bad about forgetting, aren't they? Aren't you glad that God doesn't have an Alzheimer's problem? God's not suffering from dementia. I have some timers. I don't have it all the time. Just sometimes I can't remember stuff, all right? and uh, But God suffers from neither of those things. God remembered Noah. God remembered Noah. That is his goodness. Isn't that a blessing? I mean, listen. Noah was never out of his sight nor ever out of his mind. And no matter where you and I go as his children, we're never out of his sight and we're never out of his mind and heart. That when I can't see his hand, I have to trust his heart. In my life, God is good. Amen. Even in this that which took place, we're never outside of his reach. The waters returned and the rains were restrained. And now, now there are new beginnings that are taking place. You know, eight, I don't know, if you, any of y'all ever studied numerology? Numerology a little bit. Uh, there's some interesting things there. God in the flesh, all right? You know, uh, that would be the number seven is perfection. The number six is one short of seven. That's the when man was made. Number six, that's the number of failure. What's the number? What's the mark of the beast? Six, six, six. All right. So numbers, numerology in the Bible are kind of like, oh, I don't go to seed on them. Just like I don't go to seed on seasonings when I'm cooking. Too much of something is not a good thing, amen? And, uh, and so the numerology, but it's interesting that when you have eight, eight is there, how, you know how many days are there in a week? Seven. And the beginning of a new week is on the eighth day. When would they bring a child in to present him before the Lord after he was born? On the eighth day. How many people got off the ark? There were eight people that got off the ark. There's something about the number eight. There's something about the number 12. There were 12 foundations. Each one of 12 is the number of government and ruling. 13, the number of rebellion. That's why Romans 13 talks about if you resist the government, if you resist the, the powers that be are ordained of God. It talks about rebellion in there, not being uh, of that persuasion or whatever and so forth. So numbers have their impact, like five, the number of grace. Four, like the, that represents the, the earth, or if you will, like flesh. How many compass points are there? There's four. I know there's 360 degrees, but there's north, south, east, and west. How many seasons are there? Four. God, and three is the number of Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Man made in a Trinity, body, soul, and spirit. All right, God in the flesh would be three in four, which is seven. <laughs> I'm not trying, listen. I'm just saying that sometimes, sometimes, you can go through your Bible and you see these things and they have a little impact and they're sort of like seasonings. What does seasoning do? They make something just a little better. They might make it a little more palatable. They might make it a little more interesting with the heat factor. And so numbers have their place.
People have written books on numerology. I, I don't go into that far of it, but I, I, I do think that some of these things are important. And, uh, and, but I want you to see this. Eight folks started over again and look with me, look with me in this passage. And it says, uh, let me see. Where do I want to see this? All right, look in chapter eight, look in verse four. We're almost done. And the ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now it started in the second month it came to rest in the seventh month. That's five, five months in between. That's a picture of grace. Five is the number of grace. And what's interesting in that, in, the month, or in that month, the seventh month and the 17th day. Let me read you something that Adrian Rogers wrote. Let me read this. Just bear with me as I read this. He says, the Jewish calendar began in October, the legal calendar. Now, you know, the Jewish calendar is only, they have a lunar calendar, not the Gregorian calendar, which comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, we operate on the Gregorian calendar. This is the reason why, this is the reason why that Easter, or, or if you will, the Passover is always different every year because it's based upon some other things and, uh, and so Easter changes. Sometimes it's in March. Sometimes it's in April. And, and you know what Fat Tuesday... Could you try again? And you know what Fat Tuesday is, right? Fat Tuesday. That's what Mardi Gras is. Fat Tuesday. Because, because what happens then is that Wednesday, that Wednesday starts Lent in the Catholic Church. And the reason why they would do it that way, it changes all the time because they wanted them to have a well-lit moon, a full moon. You got Ludi Gras and you got Mardi Gras, all that within that, so that they could walk to the Catholic Church when the bell rang. That's why Fat Tuesday at midnight, when things are over, the, the cops come, they move everybody out of the French Quarter. All that's over. <coughs> All that's over. All that living for the flesh is over. It's like we got to do this before, before time runs out. And they do all that. But the Jewish calendar is a different calendar. It runs on a 30 days. So that's why in five months there were 150 days between when the flood started and when the waters and everything stopped. It was 150 days. Five times 30, 150 days. And... Uh, but listen to what he said. And so, he said, do you know what the 17th day was? Well, let, let, me, let me start. The Jewish calendar begins in October. That's the legal, that, that's when their year starts, October. The legal calendar. And if you count seven months from October, you're going to come to the month of April. And then at the 17th day, he said, let me ask you this. Do you know what the 17th day was? He said, well, Passover was April 14th. And three days after Passover is the 17th day. And the Passover is April 14th. He said, do you know, do you know when the ship landed? He said the same day that later on would become three days after Passover. So what happened three days after Passover? What was that, brother? The Lord arose. He arose. And that's what happened here. It's a picture of resurrection. It's a picture of life from the dead. God rested that ark. It was no longer floating on the water. It came to rest on the ark. I mean, man. And he said, you know what day? He said, that's the day Jesus Christ came out of the grave. He said, did you know that? It is the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus died on the Passover and three days after Passover on the 17th day of the month of April, Jesus Christ came out of the grave the same day that the ark came to rest. And, uh, and so there's other things here in your Bible. I mean, it's a wonderful book. Amen. And, uh, and God has recorded these things accurately. I'm, that's why I was, I was, man, God is just good. And, uh, you know, and not just back then, he's good all the time. Amen. And he remembered Noah and he remembers 
us, beloved. He remembers us. And even though this coming judgment, and judgment is coming, he will not forget about us in the midst of these things. That's why there are so many great pictures and so many things to learn in these first 11 chapters as we talk about these four great events, the creation, the fall, and now the flood. And yet even out of that, God in his mercy made a way for man to be able to escape. And only eight of them took advantage of it. But man, thank God for salvation. Amen? Amen. But, but he made a way for us. I'm not having to worry about a ship and waters and so forth. Our ark came 2,000 years ago, died on a cruel tree for us, but got up on the third day. Amen? Delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And we are just as sealed as they were in that ship. I said probably more so. Yeah more so and so uh, the the flood it's an interesting thing it pictures in many ways some things that we enjoy today as believers mm. and that we are safe and we are secure and uh, and even for Noah satisfied there in that ark and what we have today amen mm. all right let's pray father I sure do thank you for the truth from the Bible God I thank you Lord that you're you have accurately recorded history for us and that it's not a mystery that, Lord, we can learn from it as we examine the days in which we live. Help us to be like faithful Noah, Lord. Believe what you said and be those proclaimers that you want us to be that others could get on board. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.